Whoops, let me go back. I got it, it's going. Okay, awesome. Again, all right, I'll just say it real quick for the recording. This is, I'll go back real quick just so the recording has it. Latinas in sports, understanding obstacles and opportunities in athletic at Los Angeles Harbor College. All right. Um, so turn on your cameras if you do ask a question for the question and answer. We want to see you. Um, questions you can put also in the chat and we'll answer them a little bit later as well. We have an amazing panel that's going to share their experience. So if you can just respect and honor each one of our panelists as they share their journey, that would be appreciated. All right, so this is the agenda. What we are gonna do is we're, I'm gonna introduce the panel and then we're gonna talk about some research that Dr. Vera Lopez did at um, ASU. And then we're gonna have an open discussion with the panel and talk about obstacles and opportunities that Hispanic female athletes have had, they have had and then we'll do the question and answer. So again, this is a shout out to our cross country team from a couple of years ago. They won the state championship in California and then our soccer team as well, always building and representing. So this is our amazing panel. You guys are going to be blown away by the power of these women and their journey. Um, I'm going to introduce each one of them individually and then they'll share briefly and then on themselves and I'm so excited. You guys are gonna love this, so much power. We have Brenda Villa, Brenda Rosales Correa, Amber Ruiz, Vera Lopez, Coral Costa, Diana Cordova, Patty Cardenas and Elizabeth Almeida. So we're gonna introduce them one at a time. So our first one that we have, we have Dr. Vera Lopez. Vera Lopez is a professor of justice and social inquiry and associate director of graduate studies in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. She earned her doctorate in school psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. Also, she completed a one-year clinical research internship at the Institute for Juvenile Research at the University of Illinois. And then she's done a lot of research at different other places. Um, her work has been featured in many journals, including the Journal of Family Issues, the Journal of Youth and Adolescence, and Latino studies. Her solo authored book, Complicated Lives, Girls, Parents, Drugs, and the Juvenile Justice was published with Rutgers University. She co-edited co a volume, Latinas in the Criminal Justice System, Victims, Targets, and Defenders. And her current research project focuses on Latina girls in sports. Her most recent publication on the othering of Latina girls in the school sport context can be found in the most recent issue of the Journal of Adolescent Research. And she is currently a member of the Girls on the Run IDEA Commission. So that's IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. So Dr. Lopez, welcome. Can you just share a little bit briefly um, on yourself that wasn't mentioned in your amazing bio and um, how you got started with maybe interest in um, researching Latina athletes? Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. Yes, um, going way back to the 1980s and 70s, I wanted to play Little League Baseball. Girls were legally allowed to play, but that's completely different from being socially um, admitted into games, feeling like I belonged and feeling like I was welcome. So I did not play Little League Baseball. And years later, I started running at the age of 30 and I joined a triathlon club. I completed an Ironman in 2013 and a 52 mile ultra marathon in 2013 and numerous marathons and triathlons and half marathons since then. And that sparked my interest in the role that sports can play in Latina girls' lives and looking at the current state of what Latina girls today are going through. What kind of messages are they receiving um, from parents, from peers, from schools, and other individuals? So I have been having a lot of uh, fun with my current research project, currently working on a book on this topic, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Leslie, for the invitation. Thank you so much. We're excited. And next, oh my gosh, you guys, this is so exciting. We have Brenda Villa. Um, she is considered one of the most winningest um, water polo players of all time. Brenda Villa led Team USA to medals in four different Olympic games, culminating with gold at the 2012 Olympic Games in London. 
She's the longtime captain of Team USA. She helped bridge the gap from pioneer era of women's water polo prior to inclusion in the Olympic Games to the present day success that has seen consecutive Olympic titles. She's from Commerce, California. She played high school water polo with the boys before girls water polo was widely available and became the first person from her high school, Bell Gardens, to attend Stanford University. Um, she was an NCAA champion while at Stanford. Um, and she was FINA's player of the decade at the end of the 2000s. She was also Pac-12 Conference Women's Water Polo Player of the Century in 2016. Um, since her retirement following the 2012 Olympic Games, she has pursued giving back. She's a co-founder of the Brenda Via Foundation, a nonprofit organization committed to providing aquatic opportunities for under-resourced communities. Via is helping pave a road for the next generation's involvement in the game of water polo. Via previously worked at Castilla School as Director of Equity and Inclusion and coached the middle and upper school water polo teams. At the moment, she's enjoying some family time. As of late, Via added an additional focus on the promotion of female athletics overall, joining the Athlete Advisory Board of the Women's Sports Foundation. Yes. She is also a member of the Union Americana de Natacion Executive Committee, where she is the liaison for water polo in the Americas. Brenda, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that intro. Thank you for the invitation. I, I think about access and opportunity when I think of how I got into sports. I grew up in the city of commerce and it's luck, really. Um, there was a swimming pool that offered free swim lessons, low cost swim lessons. And uh, my family started getting involved in aquatics for water safety reasons. And that really changed the trajectory of my life. I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. And my mother never played sports. But well, the thing that's important here is her support and her open mindedness allowed me, um, a first gen Latina, to explore water bowl because who knows a water bowl, especially in Mexico where my parents are from, right? Um, so back then it was a big thing for her to just support me and let me explore this new sport. And that sport led me to many places. So I'm, I'm definitely grateful for that. And I'm excited to hear about Dr. Vera Lopez's research and her book, because I think um, there needs to be more storytelling around the barriers that Latinas have overcome. So I'm looking forward to sharing and hearing more stories. I stopped my video. Sorry, I can't see my screen. Dee, can you share my video? <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see. Thank you, Brenda. I'm so excited. All right, there we go. So excited to have you. I, I can't see my cursor sometimes, so bear with me. <laughs> awesome. And then next, we actually had a teammate of Brenda at one point. Yes, we have Patty Cardenas. So, and Patty's also fiance to um, Mauricio Cedillos in our Los Angeles Heart. <laughs> See, my cursor is terrible. Cartinas attended Bell Gardens High School, where she played water polo for four years and won four CIF Division III championships. She was a first team All American three times. She played water polo for Golden West College in 2002. The team won the state championship. And Cardinas was named the California Community College MVP. Cardenas later transferred to the University of Southern California. Fight on! And in 2006, her first season with the Trojans, she ranked third on the team with 40 goals. She was an All-American honorable mention. She took a leave from absence from USC to, USC to train with the national team. Cardenas made the US senior national team after attending open tryouts in 2006. In 2007, she scored four goals in the FINA World Championships, four goals in the FINA World League Superfinal, and three goals in the Pan American Games. The U.S. finished first in all three tournaments. At the 2008 Summer Olympics, Cardina scored two goals, helping the U.S. win the silver. And that's when she was with Brenda. Patty, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. First of all, um, I want to give a shout out to Harper for allowing me to be here. You guys hold a special place in my heart. Um, not only am I a Latina athlete, but I also come from a community college as well. So I went through that route as well. So I'm here to share my experience with you and hopefully uh, you can take one or two things out of my story. 
Awesome. Patty, how did you get started? Um, I started because my older brothers played, um, well, or they were swimming and playing water pool at our community college, or not community college, our community pool, just like Brenda's and her brothers. Uh, we all kind of grew up in the same pool in the same city. So my mom wanted me to learn how to swim as well. So she started throwing me in the pool when I was, uh, I think I was eight months old when I started swimming lessons. I wasn't able to cross the pool till I was three years old. So that's kind of how I transferred into the swimming world and then the water pool world eventually. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Patty, for being here. Thank you. Next, we have Coral Costa. So Coral, um, she's from San Pedro, California. She attended San Pedro High and she played varsity softball and soccer. After high school, she matriculated to the University of Oregon on a softball scholarship. At Oregon, Costa went on to become NFCA First Team All-American, three-time First Team All-American Scholar Athlete, four times Pac-12 champion, USA ASA Player of the Year finalist, First Team Pac-12, First Team All-Academic Pac-12, led the Pac-12 in batting average season for right-handed hitters and garnered two Women's College World Series appearance. She also played professionally in the MPF for two years and was a member of the Mexican national softball team for five years. She received her master's degree in coaching and athletic administration. She's coached at Concordia, Irvine and Marymount, California. And she's also now the assistant athletic director for Bishop and coaches the softball program. She also runs her own business of teaching private softball lessons. My daughter's taken a lesson from her. She's great. Um, she loves developing kids and she strives to be the ultimate softball resource by serving the local student athletes. So Coral, welcome. Hi everybody. It's so nice to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie, for putting this on. Um, the reason why I started playing sports was a lot like Patty's. Um, I kind of was involved in softball at three and a half um, because my older sisters were playing. So I guess my mom just lied about the age back in the day. And she kind of said I was probably five, I think. And so from there, I was a three and a half year old playing with girls older than me. So I became very competitive. Um, and then, yeah, it just kind of merged into volleyball and soccer. And then I got really serious about softball, um, come middle school. But yeah, just a lot like Patty, um, I was kind of surrounded by my siblings playing sports um, and that's kind of what got me into it. But thank you, Leslie, for having me here. Yeah, thanks for being here. And then we have our own Harbor alum, Amber Ruiz. So Amber graduated also from San Pedro High. She played volleyball and softball while at Harbor. She earned her associates in liberal arts and sciences with the emphasis um, and she also did health and fitness. She received her bachelor's degree in psychology and education studies from UCLA. She's a sister of, I, I don't, I'm not good at, um, <laughs> at um, these ones, Phi Lambda Rho, right? Sorority, <laughs> correct me if I was wrong. An organization committed to empowering strong Chicana Latina leaders, passionate and making an impact in their community. She currently provides mental health services to youth and families with DCFS and probation cases. And I, I used to coach Amber at, in the strength department when she was here and she was an amazing person. So I'm so glad we got to reconnect. Welcome, Amber. Yes, thank you, Leslie, for um, letting me be a part of such a great opportunity. Um, I guess a little bit more about me. I was a three sport athlete at San Pedro High School. So I actually played volleyball, softball and basketball um, and then went on to pursue volleyball and softball at Harvard College. Um, how I got involved with sports, to be completely honest, I don't really know. Um, neither of my parents were much of athletes. So I think it, it must have been just a community type of thing um, and something within the city and other parents um, at my parents work must have been involved so it was kind of like a hey let me get my daughter in it um but yeah i just also hope to emphasize the educational part on being a student athlete because i know that um oftentimes is difficult um in in trying to balancing both uh, the athletics and education but i hope um you guys can get a thing or two from my experience and opportunities that have been provided for me as well so thank you leslie Yes, Amber, thank you. And then next we have another Harvard College, the probably the most decorated Harvard College athlete, I would say, 
I mean, Harvey goes way back. I don't know all the history, but I would bet that she's the most decorated athlete of all time. Um, she graduated from Long Beach Poly. She dominated cross country while at LA Harbor, where she was a seven time state champion. Um, she was 2018 track 1500 and 5,000 meters state champ. She was the 2019 fall individual state champ. She led her team to a 2019 state championship. Check this out. She won the track 800, 1500 and 5,000 meter state champ all on the same day. Like I couldn't even read, do that in my lifetime. She did it all in the same day. <laughs> um, she was the triple C double A female student athlete of the year in 2018, 2019. She earned her BA in liberal arts from the University of New Mexico. Oh, that's the Lobo Howl. Yes, I'm a Lobo too, Brenda. Um, and she is currently still competing in cross country and indoors at UNM and she's earning her MBA and a huge shout out because I um, reached out to her today and I was like, oh my gosh, Brenda, why didn't I ask you? Can you make it? And she's like, well, I have practice and I'm lifting, but right after lifting, I can get on. So thank you for being here, Brenda. No, thank you for inviting me. Um, anything for you. Um, and yeah, no, shout out to Harbor for providing me all the resources and without like, without you coach um, and without anything from Harbor, always like backing me up. Um, I definitely would not have accomplished anything that I did while I was there. And um, yeah, and providing me the opportunity to actually get the chance to make it to such a team that I am now. Um, but how I started, um, my family was always like a soccer family and everyone would just always wanted me to do soccer, but I was just always a rebellious one. I was just like, well, I don't want to play soccer. Like the whole family plays soccer. Um, and eventually come high school, um, I got serious about running and I mean, yeah, it's kind of history from there. Um, that's where I started and I am here today, nine years later, so. And you're still rocking it. So thank <laughs> you for being here, Brenda. Thank you. All right, next we have Diana Cordova, AKA, or Cordova. I've been in California too long, D. <laughs> AKA D has been an athlete all of her life. She was a multi-sport athlete in high school and went on to play basketball at Seattle U in Washington, where she was captain. Um, after a serious injury to her shoulder in college, she decided to help others develop their bodies to help them move without pain. In 2004, she began training and never looked back. She owns and operates DC Fit 10 Training Studio in Washington, DC. I think that's that's why she moved there to match her initials. <laughs> Dee believes that everyone is an athlete. Her training approach is to have fun and work hard. She will push you to your limits, help you reach your fitness goals, educate you on the why, and encourage you to keep fighting. She is also a co-author of the book, Dear Her, Letters to Teenage Girls and Young Ladies about lessons learned through education, athletics, and life. Because she's my sister, and she's always got my back. And she is the founder of Stronger Faster. It's a nonprofit dedicated to the training of minority female athletes. And she's helping me run this Zoom. So thank you, Dee, for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. She really doesn't have a choice, but she does. I, it's how I got <laughs> involved and started in sports. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, um, I can't believe you pronounced my name wrong since you're my sister, but there's that. So, I know, that was so bad, that was California. <laughs> so um, I'm here, Leslie invited me, um, but I also got started in sports because she's my older sister. So like most things and the things that she just read, I got involved with because of her, like the book and then the nonprofit organization that we started. Um, but I've been playing sports all my life. Uh, my goal was always to be better than her. And so, you know, she was a little bit smaller than me. So once I got bigger than her, that was a little bit easier to do. Um, we always fight about who's the better athlete, but we all know who it is. Um, anyways, it's been, it's always, it's always a fun challenge having an older sister who is competitive um, and who is an athlete. So I got involved because of that and because our parents always pushed us to do things. And then I just loved basketball. Uh, you know, fortunately, Leslie didn't love basketball as much as me, so I didn't have any footsteps to follow. So it was like I could kind of create my own 
where she had volleyball. And so we had our own sports, which I thought was very important that we had our own sports and our own identity and what we did. Uh, and then, you know, that's, that's where it was. We play, I played basketball and that's how I basically made friends and met new people and the opportunities that come with sports, I think are some of the best in life. So that's what I'm here to talk about and see what everybody's experiences are as well. Thanks for having me, B. Thank you, thank you. And then next we have Elizabeth Almeida. Elizabeth played volleyball recreationally, um, but she also found her love in fitness. She is a wellness and empowerment coach. She's a corporate wellness director running virtual wellness and fitness programs. She is also an independent business owner of Building Bodies University, where she focuses on training the mindset, body, and soul. And she runs workshops and seminars for females to feel their power and build their confidence. Um, she was a recent boot camp instructor at the Women's Empowerment Symposium, and she is certified by NCEP, and she's queen of mindset. So Elizabeth, welcome. I think she's here. I saw her, right? Yes. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I am so impressed with everyone because um, I didn't grow up playing sports, guys, like at all. The only thing I did was I played volleyball. And the only reason why I did that was because I was trying to get out of my house. I grew up in LA, um, I have five sisters, three brothers, I'm the youngest of nine. So my household was kind of crazy. And the only thing I could do to stay away from the house was play a sport. And the only, you know, volleyball, and that was, I wasn't even that good at it to be quite honest. Um, but, you know, the coaches were cool. I liked playing volleyball. I was not the greatest. Um, but something that I will tell you that I think we all have in common when it comes to sports is we don't all win the games. We're going to lose some games, but that's just like life. I don't know about you guys. I know some, I heard that you guys, some of you guys grew up in LA. I grew up in LA too. And living in the rural communities that I lived in, sometimes you just can't get out of it. And sports taught me that. You can't run away from things. If you don't win a game, you go back, you look at the play, you see what you did wrong, and you show up again. You don't quit. That's just what life is about. And although I wasn't a pro and didn't do that in college and all that stuff, I still had that competitive. I still had that grit. I still had that mentality of the athlete that no matter what life brings you, no matter what game brings you whether you lose or you win you still have to show up you still have to go back and look at the play what mistakes did i make and how can i make a difference just like life and now i get to carry that on with not only my daughters but my tribe my people that it's really a, a mindset it really is it's conditioning of the mind what you're doing on a daily basis even when people are not watching and it's pretty cool that i get to share that with my tribe, my people, what I do. And now I get to hear some about what you guys do and how you got to be in the positions that, that you are now. And if you're here, you're in here for a reason, right? Um, if the ladies contacted you because you're here for a reason, we're supposed to listen to you and, and get something, what you're gonna say and apply it into our lives. So it's just an honor to be here. Thank you for allowing me to be here and listen to you guys and um, share your stories. So thank you. Thank you so much. I love listening to you. All right. And then I'm not going to be on the panel. I'm just going to be letting everyone else share. But I just did want to introduce myself in case you don't know me. Know me. I already spoke, spoke at the beginning that I teach at Harbor College. Um, but I've trained he Heisman Trophy winners, All-Americans, Olympic athletes, state and national champions. I was at LMU as a strength coach, then Notre Dame, and then the University of Sel Southern California. Um, I did play tennis at the University of New Mexico, so I, woo, um, where I got my BS in exercise science. So that's me. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the research by um, Dr. Beda Lopez about understanding the barriers that get in the way of Latina girls playing sports and then our panel is going to share their experiences and we're going to talk about any obstacles or opportunities so i'm going to stop the share and hand it over to dr lopez okay 
Thank you so much again for inviting me. So when I first approached this study of Latina girls in sports, I decided to conduct focus groups with 78 middle school, mostly Mexican and Mexican American girls here in the Phoenix area. And one of the questions that I asked them was, can you name one Latina uh, sports person, a famous person that you have heard of or a role model? And two out of 78 were able to name a Latina sports um, athlete. And that was um, Lori Hernandez. And I'm now blanking on the other one. But the, it was clear that they really couldn't name any Latina athletes that were in the media um, that, they, that were famous. They were very well versed with, with uh, they knew who Shakira and Jennifer Lopez and entertainment women were but they could not name any Latina athletes. And so I talked to these young girls, um, most of them 12 to 14 years old about sports and their experiences. And then I have interviewed 15 high school coaches about their views of working with Latina girls. And currently I've conducted 25 interviews with Latina high school athletes all here in Phoenix. And I really wanted to get away from what I see in the limited research of Latina girls in sports. And those are deficit perspectives. And so the limited research that does exist suggests parents don't know about sports, parents don't recognize the values, Latino cultures, Latinas are very traditional. I really wanted to flip the switch and look at how schools in particular are providing opportunities for girls, how are coaches reaching out, how are they fostering a sense of belonging and inclusion. In other words, what do institutions do to make girls and Latina girls in particular feel welcome? So I adopted an intersectional approach. So it's not just Latinas, but it's Latina girls. There's the gender, there's the citizenship status, there is the ethnicity and looked at what kind of barriers existed among um, in the schools that I looked at. And so we all know the ideologies about girls in sports. Girls are still hearing that. Latina girls are still, you know, you're, you're delicate, you're like a flower. Coaches are still treating them that way in certain respects. So these are still permeating down into schools. Coaches in particular had a lot of deficit um, perspectives of Latina girls and families in terms of they don't, they have to help at home. They are not... Uh, they're expected to be family oriented, they have to take care of siblings. And so it was very interesting to talk to Latina athletes, obviously, like many of you on the panel, they had very different experiences. And so part of what I'm trying to do is to get those stories, Brenda mentioned earlier about stories, we constantly just hear deficit narratives about Latinx youth, period, right? Teen, you know, when I talk about Latina stereotypes, the girls are very rare, teenage pregnancy, gang involvement, substance use. And so really, I wanted to talk to Latina athletes in particular, like, what are your stories and how are your parents? And so I find that parents are supporting their, their athlete daughters in many ways. And as many of you mentioned, siblings play an important role. So I'm looking at you, Dee, like I did, I, I, I interviewed some twins and they were quite competitive with each other. So not that you and Leslie are twins, but, but the sibling aspect came up in talking about families. With she the, thinks we are, so. <laughs> when I talked to Latina athletes. And so I found that there was an ideology, there's the um, pedagogy in terms of the approaches, recruitment that coaches were doing. Um, maybe not thinking girls should play certain types of sports. I heard Latinas play soccer. Okay. But I interviewed a couple of golfers who were Latina girls, and they, they talked about like a coach that had reached out to them to introduce them to the sport of golfing. So how do we break down these kind of narratives, these barriers, and how do we showcase um, that Latina girls are doing many different things and many, you know, there's lots of different stories out there and that we're not all just one uh, stereotype or one mode, right? And so that's what I've been most excited about. So I, I hearken back to Brenda is like, yes, I love the stories. I love the diversity because we need more of these stories out there um, for young women so that when they are asked, can you name a Latina sports role model? It just, they can rattle off two or three, right? So even the golfers had never heard of, you know, uh, Lopez. They had never heard of 
that they had no idea. And, and that can be powerful. Now we have a wonderful panel, so I'm going to be quiet. I could talk for hours, but I want to listen and learn. Thank You're you. Awesome. Thank you for that intro. And yes, D and I are twins. <laughs> Even she thinks we're five years apart, but we're twins. Um, so on that, I would like to hear from Brenda Villa and Patricia Cardenas, um, their experience with water polo, because water polo has predominantly been um, a, you know, a white sport, um, as you say, and then Brenda has her organization on, on that. So could you guys lead that in terms of what you've seen in terms of barriers or obstacles and what kind of work are you doing with your organization? I would say that water polo is still white, um, but um, so along with that, there's there's barriers, and we both grew up in commerce, and commerce is this unique um, gem that that provides so many resources to its residents, um, free access to the teams after you take some lessons, right? If you want to join the water polo team, you don't pay for anything. So the Financial barrier, kind of scratched out. Transportation barrier, scratched out. Um, they would take us to games and tournaments and swim meets on in school, in city vans or city buses. So it really made me realize that this wasn't normal once I started traveling um, the pipeline and raising ranks in water polo, right? Where it's like, oh, there's people that don't look like me and we're still able to do all these things. So for me, it's also something I think about often now is the first generation piece and throwing in the classism along with all the other isms, um, because that's a big deal. I remember having my parents drive me to national team practices in Pomona on Thursday nights. Both parents work. My mom doesn't drive. So here my dad has this job, but it's like, oh, dad, we live in commerce. Get me to Pomona by 6 p.m. because I was asked to train with the national team, right? I never asked him if this was okay. And they never said no to me. But now that I look back, I'm like, holy moly, how did they do that? Like, I have two kids now, they're really young, but I, I'm starting to imagine the things that they'll ask me to do. And I have more resources than my parents did, right? So it's like, how did they do this? And so now it's just this eternal thing of like gratitude towards my parents and all of these lived experiences make me, made me want to start this foundation, right? Like where can we give these opportunities in other places? Commerce is special and it can do so much, but there's other places that need this support. And how do we partner with other organizations? How do we collaborate and make things happen with cities, with other nonprofits? Like it doesn't have to be the same model. So it's like, how do we work together to provide these opportunities? Because that's all it takes, right? And then you have Patty here who did, great things and she's what four years younger than me so I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> I mean Brenda pretty much sums it up I mean commerce without commerce I don't think we would ever be at the position that we're at right now I mean I don't think she even mentioned that it's weird how our both of our parents mm. uh, coming from Jalisco ended up in the same city and we both ended up both families ended up in the aquatics program without my parents don't know how to swim so just having that resource of being at that pool, everything's uh, free of charge, paid for. They they flew us to tournaments sometimes, or actually all the time, uh, provided uniforms. Um, they paid for our food, anything. We didn't have to worry about anything. And our parents obviously didn't have to, um, you know, obviously they gave us money to spend on stuff <laughs> that we would spend on things we're not supposed to, but um, everything else was paid for. They didn't have to worry about us. And I think having that support was truly, truly amazing. And also sometimes my parents couldn't drive me to like uh, youth team practices or something. So our coaches would offer to drive us there. So we had a few coaches that take, they wouldn't get paid for it. They would just drive us on their own time to get us to these practices. And without them, honestly, I don't think we would, I would be here without them. And just to add like one, something that I, there's just coaches, female role models and mentors, right? Like I see all these women on this panel and it's like, we need more of that. And to um, Dr. Vera's question about like these female athletes, I remember Lisa Fernandez, right? Like you think of the Olympics and she's not even my sport, but that's like one of the few Latinas 
I remember growing up, like I loved Michael Jordan, but here I am idolizing a black man as opposed to another like Latina that I could see myself in. But I do remember seeing Lisa Fernandez and being like, okay, look, she's dominating at this level. Like, why not? Thank you. Those bring up some great po points. And that's a good segue to asking um, Coral and Amber, who both played softball. <laughs> what did you guys, and both went to San Pedro. I don't know what years you guys graduated or, or different if you knew each other, but did you have any barriers when you were ent entering sports that you want to talk about? So my perspective, it's a, it's a little different, um, but nonetheless, I experienced it. So I did, I, I do think it's important sharing. Um, I feel like there's a sense of like a multi-generational shame or guilt associated with Hispanic heritage in your culture. Um, so for example, growing up in San Pedro, there's a lot of diversity there, which is awesome. And I'm very proud to be a part of that. And compared to other counties in California, you have, you know, different ethnicities um, dominating. So. Growing up in San Pedro, I, I was kind of around a lot of Hispanics, but my grandma, actually, she didn't like to speak Spanish at all, at all. She was embarrassed, and I never really understood why, and it wasn't until I started getting in middle school, and I started asking the right questions. Why isn't grandma answering in Spanish? Why is she, you know, only responding in English? Um, what's, what's the deal here, you know? Um, and my sisters kind of had to explain to me and my, even my aunts, they would say, you know, grandma's ashamed and she just wants to speak English. She's in America. So she just wants to speak English. So growing up around that, I kind of shied away from my Hispanic culture and I felt a little, there was no pride in it until I got into college until I was approached my sophomore year at Oregon and somebody asked me, Hey, are you Mexican? <laughs> and I go, yeah, why? Who's asking? Um, and it, it was actually that coach. He recruited me to try out for the Mexican national team. Um, and he was actually my coach in middle school and he had recruited me and gave me the opportunity um, but he was based out of Lakewood. So it wasn't like San Pedro wasn't an environment that I kind of grew out of. I actually had to kind of go outside and kind of put myself in a different situation. And I finally noticed like, wow, the closer I am to Orange County, it looks different compared to LA County. Um, but yeah, I guess looking back, I, I kind of grew up in an environment where we had guilt or shame associated with my Hispanic heritage. And then all of a sudden, here I am on the Mexican national team and I'm representing Mexico and I don't speak a lick of Spanish and I'm getting the looks and I'm getting the scoffs. And I'm, I feel like, okay, I'm in a, I'm disillusioned at this point because it's like, wow, uh, what an opportunity I have to represent a, a national team, a country, me, but I don't know Spanish. So it's like, uh, I don't want to be the forefront, but I also, I'm very prideful in that, you know? So it, it was such a weird position to navigate, um, especially being a Latina athlete. Like I wanted to, to show how excited I was. But again, I was kind of nervous too, because I didn't speak Spanish. I didn't know the Mexican national anthem, you know, and I don't know, it was just a weird situation for me a little bit. Um, you bring up a good point though. And I just wanna, so last year for Hispanic Heritage Month, I hosted um, another Zoom like this with Professor Pagan. Um, he is also at ASU, a great researcher is at ASU. <laughs> um, but he researched the Zoot Suit um, during the Sleepy Lagoon trial. And our grandfather was one of the 12 men convicted that had to go to um, San Quentin for a crime he didn't commit because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time during a time of you know uh, racial tension and a lot of uh, prejudices or biases towards you know Mexicans. Um, or kids, I mean, even just the culture, just the culture at the time, right? And so we were talking about that and I was telling him that same thing that 
once my grandfather got out of jail, um, they didn't want the same um, prejudices passed on down to their children, right? And so my mom can understand Spanish, but she didn't really speak it. And then so we don't really, I mean, we took it in school and got A's, but if you're not around it or doing it, you know, and I told him, I was like, I'm kind of, I feel bad that I don't, you know, and he's like, well, don't feel bad. They did what they had to do to survive at the time. Um, and honor them, honor, you know, what they did to, to have you survive, but you just keep honoring that by being, I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> by being your, your best self and growing and doing everything. So I know I felt a little bit of shame that I don't know Spanish every time people like talk to me and I'm like, I don't know it. Um, but he helped me. He helped me see like, don't be ashamed of it. Like, um, you're here and you're here because of their sacrifice that they, they took. So just keep moving forward. So I just wanted to add that to your story. What about you, Amber? You're muted, I think. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, I guess just in terms of obstacles um, to take it back, uh, I did live in Wilmington um, while I was, I think up until six years old. Um, so being around that kind of community was completely different from moving into San Pedro, um, where you do see a lot more um, white folks and um, just it, it is pretty. Um, what's oh my God, I'm blanking um, diverse, but there is it is definitely a culture shock, especially from Wilmington and kind of even just like the way the houses look the streets look it's just completely different um, and my experience getting into sports, I actually started at eight years old, which is fairly old um, from what a lot of my teammates were, um, and especially in the sport of softball, like Coral mentioned, um, people start t-ball at like four years old. Um, so everyone's kind of been around each other. And then here I come eight years old um, and not knowing a thing about sports, not having um, a parent who knew or played softball. Um, I did have one aunt who I think in high school was the first um, person who was involved in a in a sport which was softball and I just remember getting all her old equipment like her sliding pads and her sliding shorts and I would just I think I had like a glove for the longest even up until high school had a glove from like big five and here are all these girls that have like professional gloves or, or gloves with their names on um, on it and I'm here with like my $20 glove like I'm just trying to get involved and, and start playing but um, I think the culture shock, especially going to UCLA um, was big. I did uh, join the UCLA club team, which isn't the NCAA team, but we did travel to um, Arizona. We played teams like USC, who doesn't have um, a, a school team as well. Um, but just even being around those kind of individuals. And then like in my bio, my sorority is a Latina Chicana um, organization, which is I think one of like five at UCLA, um, which is very small compared to the um, Panhellenics uh, organizations. They have like 20, um, but that just giving me the opportunity to build that sense of community. Um, and then I know in um, Vera's uh, research, she did mention how um, like funding is an issue and just not having the same opportunities. Um, one of my obstacles I, I kind of just jotted down is also the lack of training and the costs of training. I think in low, uh, low income communities, that's difficult. You can't even, you know, there's no families that are gonna say, hey, let me send my kid to this trainer because one, they probably don't even know where to find one and then the cost of finding one um, once one is found. So. Um, I think to that barrier of the language, my grandma speaking only Spanish and having her teach a sport, I'm like, oh great, here I go. Not only am I having to um, share about a sport, she has no clue, but the, now I have to translate it in Spanish and me with my very minimal <laughs> um, knowledge of speaking Spanish, was it was rough, but that just being able to teach your parents where usually it's the other way around, your parents are supposed to be teaching the child about things, um, so. Yeah, first generation um, college graduate. That's a whole another story as well. But um, yeah, <laughs> just a few challenges to share. Thank you very much for sharing that, Amber. It's great. What about you, Brenda, and the track cross country world? Do you have any barriers for yourself? Um, 
I definitely have to say there's like the whole like economical because I'm also like um, a DACA student. So that for me, even till this day is like a struggle. Um, and you were talking about getting emotional. I'm over here about to cry. Um, it sucks because like, like you can work so hard, but at the end of the day, like we talk about like crossing barriers and stuff, but there's just like, like certain aspects of privilege that people have and don't take advantage that some of us wish we had sucks. Um, I do have to say like running has like opened so many doors for me and I've been so grateful and like I've been blessed with my high school coaches that have like supported me, um, Coach Scar as well and like even here at UNM have been amazing on like trying to provide the opportunity for me to keep going. And that is why like, I'm here, I have like, you know, thank goodness, like I, I'll be graduating with my master's with no debt. And that's, you know, a big goal and for me because I knew coming out of high school, I was like graduating high school, that's gonna be the goal and you know I'll probably start working because I was like my parents can't afford school and as a DACA student I can't take out loans I they're just like that whole situation so those are my two cents but yeah no it's it's definitely hard but um I'm proud so thank you Brenda the struggle is is it's real it's and thank you for sharing that you know and being real because people need to know because there's probably people on this on the zoom or that are listening that are experiencing the same the same thing as you are and that will um so thank you for for um being the light for them and showing them what's possible even with all the struggles and you keep showing up and you keep dominating and you keep rocking it i'm so proud of you okay <laughs> D, what about you? You grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is different, but what did you have any obstacles besides me as a sister? <laughs> yeah, just you as a sister. Um, <laughs> first of all, I just want to say, Brenda, though, that you're amazing. That's amazing. Um, and touching back to Leslie's uh, webinar that she had last year, I remember the professor said that, you know, like our grandparents were wanted something better for the next generation and the next generation. So you're doing that you're getting you're doing better you're leading hope for the next generation and the next generation um you know like when our grandfather was in san quentin i don't think that he would have thought that my sister would have had you know multiple masters and i have a master's and you know we just we have so many like if we have so much education my mom says she may have put too much emphasis on education with us but we have you know a lot of education but that's something that they didn't think of you know my mom graduated high school and that was that was a big deal and that you know it's every generation keeps getting better so Brenda I love what you're doing and you're amazing keep it up and go Lobos even though I didn't go to UNM um but you know I kind of like the reverse like I grew up in like an all Hispanic community in Santa Fe playing basketball um and I was uh hold on our dad's trying to get into the chat so I was I was I'm not that tall but I'm five nine five ten when I'm playing basketball um, which is short for basketball, but in New Mexico, I was tall. So my thing was more of like a physical thing. Like I thought I was a really tall player and I was really big and, you know, I thought, thought that I could play basketball. Um, and then I went to the Pacific Northwest to play basketball and I was no longer tall and there were no Hispanics. There was no nothing. It was just like very tall white women around me, you know, and I'm like, how do I play basketball here? Like, what do I do? Um, so it was, you know, that mine was the reverse of growing up in a all Hispanic community, um, which, which was, is fun. And, you know, it gave me the confidence that I needed, but then when I went to college, I did not think that I could compete and I didn't think that I was supposed to be here and I was supposed to be playing basketball. Um, but, you know, just the, the confidence of I'm going to work hard. Like they may be taller than me. They may be bigger than me, but they're not going to outwork me no matter what. I'm just going to work. And that's what I did is, you know, I worked, worked, worked. I earned an uh, athletic scholarship. I actually got an academic scholarship to go there. 
um, later on, I, it was also found out that it was like they needed more Hispanics in the area, which made sense once I got there. Uh, but then I worked my butt off to get that scholarship. So, you know, it's, it's not about being like the first one there or seeing somebody that doesn't look like you. I just know that no matter what I do, I am going to work the hardest. So I'm not the smartest. I'm not the fattest, fastest. I usually am mostly, usually the heaviest, the fattiest. That was like a Freudian slip, too many tortillas and beans. But you know what? It, that doesn't matter to me because I'm still going to work you. I'm going to outrace you. I'm going to outlift you. I'm going to do whatever I need to do because my thing, my superpower is hard work. And I think that was instilled with us from our grandparents who worked hard, from our grandparents who work like our families from New Mexico. And they just, they were farmers and they farmed night, day to night. And that's what they did. So our thing is hard work. And that's what we're going to do. So that I think that's for our like Hispanic culture is that we work hard and that's nobody's not going to outwork us ever. I love that D and that that leads to the next part. And I know some of our panel is on lunch break and they might need to go. Um, but if we can real quick, just talk about the opportunities, like the opportunities um, that and D just said it right, like the strengths that we do have. So what are the strengths and opportunities that you do see for um, Hispanic athletes. Uh, I know Amber, you're on lunch break, so I'll let you go first. Do you have to? I have time. Um, oh, well, then you still go first. You want me to go first still? Um, I think right now in the field of work that I am doing, providing mental health services to um, foster children or um, probation children, um, just finding like uh, big brother programs, or um, I know a lot of them have Medi-Cal and finding resources that provide the mental health aspect, but a lot of them to um, implement the activity, the social um, engagement, things like that. Um, in uh, San Pedro, I think there was a lot of uh, training opportunities, but they were pretty inclusive. So, I mean, yeah, inclusive, like you need to, to know like the right people. Um, but I don't even think I, I might've saw a pitching coach, which who, which is like a coach's daughter and it was only to benefit the team. But other than that, I never found, I never really had a trainer or new details on, on how to get better. I think Mr. Hill, you were probably my first like in-depth education in terms of building strength and um, doing the right things to get better. Um, the champs program was huge too, not only on my um, athletic career, but my education career. It, it pushed you to do better. It gave you those opportunities to um, develop as a student athlete. Um, and the fact that the student comes before, I think was huge. But a lot of the resources I did, uh, I was able to gain were around being a student athlete. It wasn't necessarily an athlete on its own um, or a student on its own. But um, yeah, that, that's been my experience. I couldn't really say I've gotten a specific opportunity that's gotten me too much better. Um, I know in terms of my professional career, being like a Latina and having a uh, knowing or even ab being able to understand Spanish has been a benefit. Um, so that has also always been a pro um, in terms of a a applying and things like that. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you. What about you, Brenda Villa? What do you think about opportunities and strengths that we have for Hispanic females now? I mean, the language, right? Like having, being able to speak another language is a huge benefit. And I think we're often shamed about it, but it's like, no, take it back because we can communicate with that many more people. So it's yes, like I work with a lot of families and I'm so grateful that I have that language and I can communicate with more people. I think about um, community. I think I was able to do everything that I did because I had the support of my parents, but the community, I remember going off to, to Stanford and the swim team, like coming together and pulling in like a collection or like, oh, here, here's what $300 you're going off away from your parents or little things like that, where it's like, yeah, we're a community. We may not be highly like financially resourced, but we could help and all that little thing. So it's like, that's a big plus, like that family knit community, like that's a huge thing that we have and we need to like lean on each other. Um, a little more. So I, I think about that. And because of the opportunities that we had in the city of commerce, I realized that other Latinas don't have that. Um, that's why I have my foundation, right? It's like, how do I reach out? And, and I wish I could do everything for free. I can't, right? So I do clinics all the time, but it's always about 
people are like, what do you, what does it cost? And it's like, well, what can you, pay? it's always like, you don't have a set price. I go, no, I don't, because I want to go to those a Latina high schools because I want them to get the same opportunities that everyone else gets. Youth sports has now become a pay to play and I am, it drives me nuts, right? So it's like, how can I do my part? So it's like, we'll make it work. You tell me if you want to work with me, we'll make it work because we talk about mentorship, seeing like representation matters, seeing ourselves and our coaches. So I'm just one person, but I'm doing um, all that I can. And that's why I don't walk away from my sport because there aren't that many of us. So if I'm not visually in people's faces, then it does become a very white sport. Thank you. I have a light sensor. So when I disappear, it's because I have to go throw something at the light to turn back <laughs> on. <laughs> but thank you for that. That's awesome. What about you, Patty? What do you think about the opportunities and strengths that we have out there? Definitely. As Brenda has mentioned before, we have the opportunity to tell our stories. Um, I had the opp opportunity to be a mentor for a couple of athletes. Even at USC, they asked me to be a mentor for one of the athletes there. So just giving my story, being a Latina and an athlete at USC, um, just trying to, you know, give my experience as much as possible, being a transfer student, especially, and being a Latina. Also in the workforce, my career right now, um, so um, I coach water polo in my community, at like City of Commerce, and the HR manager of the company that I currently work for had his daughters there, and that's how I got into this company. Once I got into the company, um, they opened up a business in Mexico. Nobody in my company knew how to speak Spanish. So that gave me that resource or that, you know, advantage to be able to get that experience. I didn't have experience in anything before I went into this company. So once I got in there, that got me one step closer to where I wanted to be. So I think having that language, practicing that language and keeping and maintaining that, I think that's helped me a lot throughout the time. Thank you. That's awesome. And Coral, opportunities and strengths? Yeah. So um, again, I'm going to go back to kind of like my middle school days. I was considered a culture kid, um, even though I felt kind of white because my mom was European, European descent, um, German, Irish, Dutch. And then my dad was Hispanic and Puerto Rican and Native Hawaiian. So I kind of got the best of both worlds. But um, when I was recruited to even be on a travel team, a, a club organization in middle school, I noticed that that coach that recruited me, he was Hispanic. Um, and I feel like he saw something in me I didn't see. Um, and when I went over there to play with his team in Orange County, I was quote unquote, the culture kid, culture kids. He had a group of us that he brought in. Um, and he did this on purpose to kind of disrupt the Orange County girls that were blonde hair, blue eyes, um, that had that sense of ease um, and just opportunity, you know, it just existed for them. Um, but looking back, because I am Hispanic, I feel like, boom, that was an opportunity that he kind of fed me to and then because of that being on that team I got to be on the firecrackers organization with Tony Rico and Tony Rico he was a big Hispanic you know figure within softball and he was able to have those ties to the university systems and kind of feed me through there um and then from that opportunity I don't even know how but I was approached by Mexico to to represent their national team um so just being Hispanic um, and trying out for Team USA on the softball team, it was not a thought in my mind at all that I would be on Team USA, that I would be on an Olympic team for softball. There's only like, what, 15 spots? But because Team Mexico was there, I had the opportunity to be on an Olympic team because I was Hispanic, you know? Um, so I don't think necessarily I would have, got to travel to Japan, Santa, uh, the Dominican Republic, you know, Colombia, to play in the Central and Pan American Games, to play at the World Cup. I would have never gotten the opportunity to win a gold medal or a silver medal if I wasn't Hispanic. Um, and even though I thought in my head, there's absolutely zero chance to play pro and at the Olympic level, I didn't even know the Mexican national team existed until it just was thrown in, my, in front of my face. And then boom, I'm 
considered an Olympian. What? Like, is this real life just because I'm Hispanic? You know? So great opportunity in that way and how I looked at it for, for me personally. Awesome. Thank you. And Brenda, what about opportunities for you? I mean, you're getting, you said you have no debt and you're going to have your MBA, but anything else you want to share on that? Um, I think just like, uh, the opportunities of like, I mean, I personally take advantage of it just because like my top situation, but recently I've seen a lot of opportunities for like so many Latinas, even just like when you're trying to apply for like business and like, um, like the school in itself has like, there's just so many opportunities for women, especially Latinas because of minority. Um, and it's just like the opportunities that I've seen that people like that us as women can take, it's just like amazing, especially just, you know, since I'm still like in the system, um, and it's just, you know, I hear a lot about like how, you know, sometimes it can stop us, but it's honestly our greatest asset. And it's just like, you know, if you just even do a little bit of research, there's so much that like you can do and can try to take advantage of. And like D said, it's hard work always pays off. And there's always been you know, hard work will always be talent. And I can say that for myself because, you know, as a runner, it's, you know, high school, it was diverse, but there was definitely like, you know, your, your white girls, your high end class. And then there was me, you know, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I am running in Converse and we're just going to cross our fingers and just run fast, you know? So I think it's just, if you just put your head down and do the work, go for it, do a little bit of research. There's so much that we can take advantage of. And I just wish more people did because, you know, if I had the opportunity, oh my God, like I dive right in, but uh, it's just like the things that so many people can do. And it's just, the opportunities are there, just work hard, get there and, you know, things will happen, you know, as long as you have also like that positive mindset, you are set to go. Yes, you are, mama, I love that. D, what about you? Opportunity strengths. Um, so my opportunity, it's, I'll go, since everybody talked about sports and you know what that's done, I'm gonna do a little bit different, talk about the people that it introduced me to. So like being able to play in sports, like all of my friends are because of sports. Like growing up, I had a stutter. I couldn't really talk that well. Um, you know, I had to go to speech therapy. I was a very shy person. My sister got all of the personality, but um, you know, like, so, but I was good on the basketball court. And so it was like, I was able to make friends because people were like, oh, she can play basketball. Let's be friends with the athlete, right? Or let's be friends with the person who can play sports. And so it was easier for me to make friends that way because I had the confidence of being able to play basketball to be like, you know, pick teams at, at whatever, a recess. So, you know, so then I made friends that way. And from there, uh, you know, BJ or Leslie, as people call her, um, <laughs> like my friends are like the world to me. And to this day, like I, there's not a day that goes by where I don't t text my college friends. Like they are like so close to me and, you know, we were teammates for so long. So those opportunities, I think personally, help me just get confidence in life and have people who like, if I have a down day, I can go to them who I know I'm not in the fight alone because of the teammates that I made through sports, which, you know, if I didn't play, I wouldn't have met them. I wouldn't, I don't even know how I'd make friends, <laughs> you know? So that's what I did that. But then on the second thing is I coached basketball in Northern New Mexico at a, you know, predominantly like first generation Mexican high school. And the, Kids, student athletes, their parents just didn't understand the importance of sport to them, right? It was just like, no, they have to work. Like, they don't have time to go to practice. They don't have time to do this. They don't have time to do this. But then they saw that, like, somebody who looked like them, who came up from, like, a similar background, was able to go to college and, you know, turn it into a career. So, you know, it was just, like, being able to be the example for the next generation, I think, is a great opportunity. So the plus side for sports was that I was able to make friends. And I think the opportunity is to be able to take our hands, 
reach them back to whoever is behind us and just help pull them up and go forward from there. Because this is just, I mean, it, that you're able to get this many people on this group, like growing up, I don't even think we could have gotten this, you know? So it's just great to be able to see everybody. And we just got to make sure that we reach our hands back and pull everybody else up with us and just keep rising and keep rising and keep rising. Yes, I love it. And that, that was um, one of the reasons we rewrote, we wrote Dear Her was because we wanted people to see that this is what it's about, right? It's about um, you're never alone. Your struggle will become your strength and we need to celebrate and support each other. It's not a competition. It's a collaboration of us empowering and supporting one another. So um, Dr. Lopez, you mentioned a lot of deficit research in your thing. How about all this? How about this panel for the opposite of that for you? What I, do you think I, of the opportunity? I love um, the idea of the asset approach because we historically, um, Cora, I really you know, understood your story because I grew up in Texas, the same messages, the assimilation approach really did a lot of harm for Latino communities because it was like your your culture is not good enough you need to assimilate and you need to speak English and now I see there's a resurgence of let's go back and I think Leslie what you said let's let's embrace our abilities to our but to be bilingual to be bicultural um, and to really think about the funds of knowledge the cultural strengths that we bring um, as Latina women and to start shifting those deficit narratives. And I think that this panel is an excellent example of that. And what I love is that we're talking about opportunity structures. So it's not just that we're exceptional, although I think you are all exceptional, but it's also, we, can, we have so many exceptional um, young women out there. And if we provided those opportunities, then it would be, you know, it would be, that would be my dream if I had a dream that we would have all kids who wanted to play sports and to have those opportunities to excel. Thank you. You guys are all amazing. And I just want to thank you for sharing. And I want to open it up. If there's any questions from anyone in our Zoom audience, if you want to ask, you know, Brenda, Amber, or the other Brenda, <laughs> uh, Coral, Dee, Patty, or Dr. Lopez, any questions or just general to the group, if you guys have any comments or questions, um, you could raise your hand and we can let you answer if anyone has any comments or questions. Sigard? Well, there is one for all of them. Okay. Hmm. How, how does it feel to be part of the Hispanic history? Oh, that's what Taylor is telling me. I, I run. All right, so everyone, how does it feel to be part of Hispanic history? I am? What? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's weird. Um, I guess it's a bittersweet feeling because it's something that we shouldn't be celebrating just for one month. Um, you should be celebrating it year round, but it's an honor. I love it. Just keep doing it. Nice. Brenda, Bia? Yeah. I mean, the word sometimes, I mean, it's hard for me to identify as Hispanic. I, I like to use Latina, but I think in the same, you know, mind frame framework, um, yeah, it's an honor. And like Coral just said, like, I'm a Latina every day, all year long. So I celebrate this always, but I'm not going to hate that people want to bring an emphasis because I think others need to hear these stories, right? Like I'm like Googling as I'm hearing everyone's stories here. It's like, you guys are all amazing. So I wanna be connected. So this is great because it amplifies our stories. Yeah, and you know, you bring up a good point even on the Latina Hispanic, like which, you know, I like I that's why I've used both of them because I like, I don't know which people are gonna relate more to. So I had to use both in the title, <laughs> Patty. What about you? What about being a part of Hispanic Heritage Month? I mean, I think it's a it's a privilege, honestly. I mean, being a Latina is probably the most amazing thing in our sport. We're the only two Latinas in the past how many Olympic teams that we've had. So I think uh, celebrating that, and I think each aspect of um, Hispanic Heritage Month has um, they outline uh, amazing people every single 
um, subject that they have or whatever. But I think this is a privilege and I think I am so grateful and blessed to even be here and trying to be a part of this history. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fia Ve, is that how you say your name? Fia Ve, do you have a question? Fia Ve? Um, my name is Fia Vae Leota. Uh, you can just call me Vae for short, but I'm not Latino or Hispanic. I'm Samoan, but like just to hear from like a beautiful board of women about Latinos in sports is really inspiring because in my culture, Samoan women are more geared towards housework or sports. Like you could be either or, or in the military, nothing else. We're basically like stereotyped into a few. But I just wanted to thank you guys for like inspiring me because I've never been in this type of environment where women are supporting other women. I was always, I don't know, I was raised in the community. I'm, I'm not from here. I just moved here from Hawaii and I'm currently attending Los Angeles Harbor College. But I grew up in an environment where, you know, everyone's a competition. You can't trust anybody. You just got to look out for yourself. The only person that you can rely on for information or for support is nobody but yourself. So I just want to say thank you to the board for, so, for inspiring me to keep going because I want to be a doctor. That's why I'm here at Los Angeles Harbor College to be a cardiologist for my family. And I just want to thank you for telling me not only to not give up, that, you know, the reality is there's going to be struggles. I like how you guys point that out, that the world is not going to be, you know, you're not sugarcoating it. The world is not going to be, you know, all happy. There are going to be moments where people, even your closest friends, will seem to not, you know, support you. And I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing to keep going because you know there are probably many other students like me on the zoom meeting or in life where they just love hearing from people from their own community support them in sports and whatnot love that you keep going I, it's I love that. any other questions or comments from our tribe out here I think you guys just blew everyone away. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, let's just end with saying if anybody has any questions, maybe if you have a social media or a way for people to connect if they have any questions where they can reach out to you. Um, so Coral, let's start with you. How would people reach out to you if they have any questions for you on the site? Okay, so I'll put it in the chat, but if you guys want to follow me for any updates, go ahead and follow at Coach Coral on Instagram. <laughs> um, but on Facebook, I don't know why I didn't make it Coach Coral, but I, for if you guys have Facebook, you can find me on Coral Costa softball page. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, as far as like reaching out, you can also find me on the Bishop Montgomery website if you want to find my email. It's on there too. Um, but yeah. Awesome. D. All right. So I just, I'll drop my thing in the chat too. It's just at DCFit10, at DCFit10 on Instagram. That's my company name. Um, 10, my sister thinks that I named it after her for her number was 10, but it's because I want people to work at a 10, feel like a 10, be a 10. So that's why we have 10 there. So DC, because it's my initials, fit, and then 10. There it is. <laughs> but Patty, what about you? Hi, you guys can find me on Instagram. I'm at Patty underscore C-A-R-D. Um, so go ahead and send me a message for any questions. Thank you. Brenda Via. I added my Instagram and my Twitter. It's Brenda for Via, the number four. <laughs> um, so that's on in the chat. Awesome. Amber. Oh, so I'll also add my um, Instagram handle. I actually was beginning to start a fitness page. Um, so I'll drop that down. I have been off for a bit. Um, little self disclosure I did lose 50 pounds. So I tried to document what I was going through um, and also the mental health aspects of things. Um, so I will share it there. I apologize if there 
it's been a while since I've posted, but I will definitely, this is encouraging me to get back to it and just use it as a platform to reach out. But um, also put a work and sell number. If you guys have any questions, you could contact or text me through that as well. Ah, that's awesome, Amber. What about you, Brenda? Rosales, Korea. Um, I also have, yeah, I put that on. I put my Insta and Facebook. Um, I kind of don't really use Facebook. It's always like for like my family in Mexico, yeah. but um, but yeah, I mean, feel free if you also, I don't know, if you all want to text me, call me, FaceTime me. I mean, I'm always free. Uh, if I don't call, if I don't answer them, I definitely will call back. Um, but you have to let me know who you are because I became a lot of scams and I'm just like, yo girl, don't have time for those. But um, yeah, no, shoot me a DM. If you ever want to text, call, ask me any questions, especially because I am still um, in college and stuff. So I can definitely provide information as to uh, transferring into junior college, what it was like, um, transferring out of junior college, um, being at school and also starting um, a master's so let me know and if I don't have an answer I will definitely do my best to give you an answer um, do a little research and get back to you on it so feel free awesome and for those of you that are watching the recording later or listening to this it's Cori c-o-r-i-i-a-1-5 because you're not going to be able to see the chat <laughs> and Dr. Lopez what about you um, I have a Twitter and I'll just read it if you can't at Vera underscore Lopez PhD. And I post mostly um, issues related to youth injustice and supporting uh, youth, particularly girls and youth of color broadly. And if you have any questions about ASU or UT Austin, I, I always do my Longhorns because I'm a Texas native, but college or graduate school, I'm happy to answer those questions as well. And my email is vera.lopez at asu.edu. And just let me know that you were, you were in the audience for this panel. Um, I'm the grad director for my school at ASU. So happy to answer any questions or if you just need whatever, just reach out. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm Leslie T underscore Coach C on Instagram. If you didn't get any of theirs, you can reach out to me and I can connect you with theirs again. Um, so Leslie T underscore Coach C and I'm at Los Angeles Harbor College where you will find me in the weight room or in the champs room most of the time. I want to thank our amazing panel. This was so powerful. You guys have just empowered the world. Um, not just within this hour, but by who you are. The whole journey from your ancestors to being here, to your journey, to where you are today and to what you continue to do and give back um, and share. You are a light and you are a strength to everybody. So we just, I, I thank you. I thank you so much and I honor you for being here and, and for everyone that's on this Zoom that, that was able to feel the, <laughs> strength and power of, of all of you. And so I just thank you very much. Um, continue to go forward and, and just shine bright. Remembering your struggle will become your strength. And as you continue to struggle and turn them into strengths, keep shining and flying high. And as we all say, reaching back to each other. So thank you again and have a great, great weekend. Thank you guys, appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Hio. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye, everyone.